with this LSC webinar using the lens of the LSC Roundtable experience at California State University last fall. We're going to help you explore how um, focusing on the Roundtable experience and planning for the learning of spaces really becomes an institutional-wide initiative. The title of this uh, Roundtable uh, webinar is explicitly to talk about campus-wide attention to learning spaces, to learners and learning. And it was very, um, I was very pleased to read some of the reasons people wanted to be on the round table because the, the questions or the interest was in a, getting other campus-wide people, uh, other people across the campus interested in and involved in thinking about spaces in the context of ongoing institutional initiatives. Um, this, This visual, um, it's not on the screen. Yeah. Pardon for our um, production glitch. And so this visual really talks about its objective of how the roundtables were designed and implemented. It's an iterative process of capturing, discussing, sharing, and recreating questions about learning, planning, and the future. It also signals one of the tools for strategizing that was so important, central part of planning the roundtables, the visualization of how this planning happens. It is, it is a circular activity. These are the people who will be, uh, some of the people who will be presenting today, but it also illustrates the, the um, process of the roundtable, the design of the roundtable to bring a small group of people together, people from different um, spheres of influence across the campus responsibility, um, kind of edgy thinkers, um, people who um, I have a kind of creative thoughts about um, the what and why and how of learning, um, and mostly not about learning spaces to come to the round table. And so each of these people will be talking a little bit later about um, their experience and about the posters that are illustrated here. Um, these, are, these are our facilitators, and we included this in the copy of the PowerPoint because some of you will um, perhaps um, run the the PowerPoint through with your colleagues on your own campus and you, now you know who these people are talking and you may be able to um, call them up and say, what did you mean by that? Um, so, um, so this is, we had four strategies that we announced when we um, um, planned the round table and the, these are the four strategies and I'm just going to run through them right now to kind of give you a flow of how our conversation is going, is going to happen. Um, and so um, the second strategy is that you really start from where you are now and you think about what's happening now at the institution that really provides a solid foundation for thinking about the future. And some of you had indicated in your uh, why is this um, roundtable of interest to me, um, there were several of you that said you're beginning or in the early stages of an institutional plan and you just want to do, um, think about how to bring people together on a campus to think about things. And I'll talk a little bit more later about the uh, yardstick for planning, but the round table here at Cal State LA was um, the sixth one that I did last year in 2016. And at the first one at Georgia Tech, um, one of the small three-person teams came together, four-person teams, I guess, um, came together around the notion of a yardstick for planning and that when you really start getting serious about digging spaces, designing spaces, paying architect, paying whomever, you're at about 29 inches to 25 inches, no, to 29 inches to 32 inches. But all that preceding, um, the, the first part of the yardstick is the things that we're talking about here today, about what Cal State LA kind of explored together during our round table and then kind of set out to take some intermediate, small, maybe some initial small steps to kind of move down that, that um, the yardstick of planning. And um, so the fourth 
Third strategy is outlining an agenda to do something. And one of the roundtable groups came up with the metaphor of uh, learning happens everywhere. That's the, the uh, motto and the metaphor is a campus-wide ecosystem. And so when, the, when we talk uh, in, later in strategy three about how to think together about what can happen on a campus, you will see how their, their mental image of what an ecosystem could be or might be or should be at Cal State LA um, could be expressed visually and then gave them some opportunities to kind of pick pieces of it out and then try to um, move forward. And so then keep going. And I'm so, um, as I've been working with my colleagues here at Cal State LA, especially um, Dean uh, Pam Scott Johnson, about all the things that have started to happen or kind of step back and look at things that could happen everything since that round table, <laughs> things that I think might not have happened as easily had the people had not this opportunity to sit together and um, really learn what other people are seeing. And I want you to remember I inserted the, the little diagram of imagining, thinking, creative. And if you um, know when you work with your students, if you're a professor to, in, it with a, in the classroom, this is also what you want learning to be when your students kind of start to think about things and share things and work together and things. And so often I think of planning as learning, learning as planning. And so kind of keep that mental image in your mind that nothing, when I, I, I stop here, this isn't in my script, but this Georgia Tech um, round table, one of the architects there said, my goodness, I didn't realize that architects are linear thinkers and academics are six thinkers, they go round and round and round. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, they keep coming back and returning to the conversation. Just, we walk on a campus and we sit down and we do it and we leave. <laughs> and so I think this concept of involving the architects in these kinds of conversations has been a very important outcome from the round tables. Um, so um, I inserted these two slides. Uh, on research on informed participation and empowered learning, um, because I wanted to emphasize that these roundtables are not rocket science, or the, uh, didn't, the notion or the possibility of a roundtable, the potential of a roundtable didn't just come out of the blue. There's solid research that getting people together to think socially, creatively. This, the people at the bottom of this paper uh, who are at work are at Colorado, um, State <coughs> University of Colorado Boulder, for me, some of the most creative prodders for my thinking to think about the, um, the impact of getting people together, social creativity, and I think one of the lines in there, one of the opening paragraphs in there, their, one of their research reports is that the power of the isolated individual is greatly under overrated. <laughs> and so I think that's what we're trying to um, illustrate or maybe play around with, experiment with the, the uh, design and the notion of a round table to catalyze more creative thinking about learning and learning spaces. And here's another one, some of you know Adriana Kazar, she's here in Southern California. Um, from my uh, round, uh, round of colleagues and, and people I've worked with, Adriana is one of the leading um, researchers on organizational change, institutional change. And if, you've, um, if you're connected with the Association of American Colleges and Universities, Adriana has several reports that you can see through that. I see some people here behind me uh, agreeing with me. She's a great resource, and even if you can't get her to your own campus, you can pull down her work through AAC and use material. So there's a lot of work and research out there on this kind of organizational planning, and so I invite you to look at that. And so now we're going to um, hear from, I'd like to um, <laughs> offer um, Dean Scott Johnson the opportunity to to um, welcome us and greet us and give her some thoughts on the round table. And she's going to um, be paired with or coupled with uh, one of her colleagues, uh, Carlos Gutierrez. Carlos Gutierrez, who's a member of the chemistry faculty. And Carlos was at the, both of these colleagues were at the round table we did at uh, Loyola University, Miramont, LA. And so they kind of convened and co collaborated with me in thinking about this round table. So um, I think now you're going to um, uh, here from Carlos and um, Pam. Pam, I know you start. Sure. Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Scott Johnson. I'm the Dean of Natural and Social Sciences here at Cal State LA. I do want to greet you on behalf of my president, uh, Dr. William Cavino, and our provost, Lynn Mahoney. But I also want to just let you know how much fun this particular project was. 
Uh, one of the things that I think is exciting uh, about what we're doing on our campus is focusing on our students, focusing on student learning, making sure that there are organic ways in which our students can have access um, to their instructors, uh, be able to communicate and, and have conversations among themselves. And then we have to actually look at whether or not our space facilitates that. And so having come from another campus where we've been planning and looking at a space, building a space that was really very collaborative, it gave me a great opportunity to do a couple of things. Uh, invite our colleagues to, invite my new colleagues to talk with us. Um, silos, you know, don't really work well when you're really focusing holistically on student learning. And it gave me a chance to kind of have us have a collective conversation about space. I also want to point out that the campus was also in a very structured conversation about the spaces that we have and what we're doing. And so I invited my my colleague Carlos. Uh, in fact, before I even got to campus, I invited him to go to this. And Carlos, you want to share your thoughts about the event? Absolutely. <clears throat> I had no idea why I got invited. I'm a chemist, and, and I took it as an opportunity to spend time with this new dean and try to influence this new dean and get her on the right track before she got on, on campus. And then she had the audacity of showing up two hours late. So there I was with a bunch of architects and, and, and folks who knew what they were talking about in terms of space planning. But what a great experience it, it, it was. Get a bunch of interesting people together talking about space. Um, well, of course space has an influence on, on how students learn. Um, I had never formally thought about that, but as a consequence of, of hanging out with smart architects and smart academicians, and, and their viewpoints that they took helped clarify in my own head some of the things that had been rattling around there, but without, without much, uh, much focus. So, so the round tables are a wonderful way of goals clarification, and that's what I got out of, uh, out of this thing. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this in this particular uh, fashion? The focus that, that, that the group had less on answers and more on questions was, was a wonderful way to get creative juices uh, flowing. So I got a lot out of it and, and a lot of ideas on how we can change space. Even though we might not have a major uh, project going on, what do we do with the spaces that we have now? And spaces in the plural because we're not going to have one type of classroom. We have many different functions, uh, many different needs for many spaces but that we as colleagues can, can, can talk about these things and come up with reasonable solutions. Thank you very much. Um, it was interesting when Carlos, who walked into the, um, the round table space like a deer with a, in the headlights, um, when we walked from one room to another to, to have different kinds of um, small group discussions, Carlos said, I didn't know this was going to be fun. And so I don't know what kind of circle Carlos runs in usually, <laughs> but um, I think um, I was pleased that um, he came and he left um, having, having fun. Um, so um, I, I'm using, as often, some of you have heard me perhaps before um, having this um, visual to explain how planning has happened or has changed over the 25 years that I've been in the world of planning learning spaces. Um, I started, as some of you may know, with the work with Project Kaleidoscope, which was focused on undergraduate science reform. And the only thing we were changing was in research labs so undergraduate students could, could participate with faculty research. So there was only one pedagogy that worked, and it was undergraduate research, and there was documentation why that did work. But these were pretty siloed of sense approaching, uh, approaches to planning. You know, one faculty member plus one facilities officer. Planning. Everybody was siloed in their planning. There was no connections. Um, within an institution or perhaps beyond the institution, but you all know how wonderful, how many wonderful things have happened over the past 25 years, which has really broken down the barriers um, between departments on a single campus, including science departments on a single campus. This may somewhere maybe still siloed. Um, but um, now we're working more, and I love this graphic that I found from a national uh, NSF um, brochure from their social sciences division on how interconnected the world has now become and how everything is so connected that you have to plan for those connections in the planning. 
and this is organizational change. And I like the, the story behind that is um, how many nodes need to be connected in order for good planning to happen in order for things. Now, you'll hear a little bit later about the nodes for Cal State LA in their geographic region because you reach out and beyond the, re uh, the region. You'll hear a lot about different kinds of nodes. Um, you'll hear about the work between the arts and letters and the librarian and kind of building new kinds of connections for their students. So when you think about um, even starting on that yardstick for planning where you are, think about how many people you can connect with, how many different people you can connect with. And um, if, uh, so that I encourage you to think about that. Um, so now we are going to um, um, go through some of the questions that, that people ask. People walked in, you walk into the round table, not everybody walked in with their eyes in the headlights like Carlos did, wondering why am I here? And I think some of you asked that when you came in, why am I here? Um, they were courteous enough to their new dean to say if she wanted us to be there, we would like to be there with her. And so um, people walked in and kind of um, talked about what, what they brought to the table, what had been concerning them, what they had been thinking about, um, and this whole bit of concepts, uh, the roundtables are focusing on the planning of the future of learning and learning spaces. So you could drill down on each of those words and have conversations. Uh, and especially the roundtables were focused on, on the future, questions for the future. And so, Carlos, you can't see it there very well, I'm sure, but um, I'm going to let you start and they're kind of passion statement at the round table at uh, Loyola Marymount about what kept you up at night when you're thinking about learning and learners and your students? Well, um, it's I've been at Cal State LA for 42 years. This is the only real job I ever had, I've ever had. And um, there comes a point in your life that they start giving you awards. Um, and, and so I was convinced I was a pretty good teacher, but I knew that I was a fraud. Um, I was a fraud because I could stand in front of students and entertain them, but I wasn't sure that I was a, an effective an effective teacher in aiding in their in their in their um, in their learning. And um, I thought I was teaching chemistry, and then maybe I was teaching about chemistry, and then I realized I was teaching the catechism of chemistry, um, the world as as it is. Uh, uh, we were presenting chemistry as though it were um, revealed truth. And that just didn't sit well. Uh, that's fine if we're having a discussion of religion, but absolutely inappropriate if we're, if we're talking about science and how science happens. And then I decided, well, in order to be a decent teacher, I need to teach science the way science is done. And in order to do that, what keeps me up is that if I'm not doing that, for my students, then I am denying them the possibility of, of becoming scientists. If they leave Cal State LA thinking that science is all this, these catalogs of facts, um, I will not have helped them make the transition from a consumer of information to perhaps a participant in the creation. And so that, those are the things that keep me, keep me awake at night. And I'm sure there are a lot more, but I thank you very much for that, Carlos. Here are um, um, some of the quotes from the posters that people had around the room. And you can see me kind of in the corner there, but everybody had to walk, everybody had to walk in and post on the wall. And um, one of them asked, how do we transform aged facilities into 21st century learning spaces? Did, what did you think about when we talked about that, um, David? I'm David Connors, the Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Letters, and this is a, a big issue for us, and just in general, but also I'll give a, a, a um, specific context for the campus as well, but we've learned so much more about teaching and learning in the uh, past couple of years, and it's so important that uh, students are involved in active learning, and most of our buildings were built in the 1950s. Um, some of them seem like they were built in the 1850s, but um, that's the library. Th that's <laughs> we'll get, and, and I'll let you take over on on uh, that one. And um, it, just as far as for technology and so forth, when we have um, aging buildings, this is is 
uh, you know, really a major problem. The specific context that I will give is um, I, my discipline is music and I work in the music building. And when that was built in 1857, no soundproofing. I mean, who would have thought soundproofing was needed for a music building just because we make sound? Uh, the building was closed from 2000 to 2002, and it was, you know, brought down to the studs and, and redone. And there were a lot of great, wonderful things that were done at that time. However, the technology infrastructure is still woefully inadequate for what we need. However, because the building was redone at 2000, 2002, it's on the bottom of the list. So, um, how do we deal with those particular uh, issues, uh, performing spaces? I could talk for an hour on that. We won't let you I, do that. Would, pardon? We won't let you I do figured, that. I figured it is not. You never want to give a performer a microphone. That's always <laughs> very, very dangerous. But the point you're trying to make is focusing on the future. And w w we know so much more about teaching and learning the focus used to be when I went to grad school, how do you teach? And now the focus is on how do our students learn and adapting our teachers to our teaching uh, pedagogy to the way in which our, our students learn. And with fixed furniture and the uh, aging infrastructure and so forth, it just makes it very difficult at times. Carlos, uh, I, I, this Carlos, uh, the other, next question is about um, something about the library. And I think you share um, David's um, concern with dealing with spaces and buildings that aren't what you want today. So, well, Carlos, I'm very the dean of the University Library here, and for me, uh, spaces has been a very important aspect of the library. And you know, libraries have been changing quite a bit. So, um, one of the things that I was been thinking about, one of the things that I think is important for us to Discuss is how can we change the behavior of our students when they're in the library? Given the library's very traditional environment, uh, a lot of the furniture that we had in the library was very traditional, so the behavior was very traditional. So we really wanted to create an environment that not only looked different but feel different, with the hope that students would then act different. So what we're really engaging is really doing a lot of observation of our students, really get a sense of sort of. Uh, what they're doing in the library, and really talk creating environments in the library that really uh, are dynamic. Uh, uh, not everyone learns the same. Uh, one of the things that I'm reminded of is that most of learning that happens uh, happens outside of the classroom, and really universities need to spend a lot more time thinking about the environments that we create that are outside the classroom and the lab, which the library is here, but a big part of that. I can see the library really is a lot of classroom on campus. So. I think there's an opportunity for campuses and universities to really rethink the role of the library as far as it being a learning environment. One of the most interesting questions that I heard from a campus that I visited six, seven years ago is what was your driving question in planning a new library? And the driving question was what do we want the students to feel like when they walk in the first door into the new spaces? And one of the answers that that campus um, arrived at, that was the mantra for there was, that the student would walk in and say, look around and say, wow, they designed this just for me. And I think both this learner-centered planning and you kind of think of um, starting with the student experience and, and going backwards. Thank you very much. Um, Emily, when, when we were together, you, you brought up, even though uh, you're an engineer and everything you focused on, the most important thing to think about is Culture, right? You want to talk a little about that? Right. So I'm Emily Allen. I'm Dean of the College of Engineering, Computer Science, and Technology. And I think where I'm, where I was coming from in this conversation is I started doing active learning 20 years ago, 25 years ago before it had a name. <coughs> um, and I believe firmly that you can, you can change the learning culture in your class no matter what wretched kind of space you're in. And that shifting the conversation from teaching to learning and shifting what we want to happen in a classroom or in a, or in a laboratory, even an engineering laboratory, shifting all of that towards a culture of student learning has to come first 
Because if you if you go out and design your space, but you haven't really changed your culture of interaction, then you'll just have another space that won't be useful, you know, five years from now. So I think these things have to happen together. The conversation about moving from teaching to learning, um, the conversation to really break up some some dearly held ownership culture, all of those things have to happen at the same time as you're thinking about new space. Um, and that conversation is actually more important than the you know, architectural conversation. Because if you do that first, and then you have architectural conversations, you know, then you can really have that wow space that does what everybody needs and creates learning. Because as everybody said, students don't Students, learning takes place in the student's mind. And physically where that body is, you know, that, that could be a classroom, that could be at home, that could be in the library, that could be on the bus. So it's, it's really about how are we creating learning mental spaces for our students, and then how do we reflect that in physical space? Pam, you want to talk a little bit about um, integrate the larger institutes to research learning, research based learning, and I think we talked about at the round table that that's become one of the institutional priorities to integrate research into some, um, some or all of the undergraduate experience. So, and for all students, not just for scientists, um, not that Carla is here. Um, you want to talk about that? Yes, yeah, so look, I, I want to go back and, and, and say so the College of Natural and Social Sciences has really kind of two. Um, frameworks for educating students. Natural scientists have, you know, colleagues like Carlos in chemistry and, and physics and mathematics, where the laboratory space and really engaging students into the scientific process, giving them opportunities to engage in that process, be it in a laboratory or discussions in the lecture, uh, that's very important. And the social sciences really focus on the relationship that takes place in, in, in terms of learning, um, in, in terms of the psychology and history uh, and the sociology departments, you really are, are talking about not architecturally derived spaces, but spaces that create relationships, that create conversations. And so we want to take this kind of structural framework of laboratory space and really integrate it more with the kind of conversational and relation, relational space. And that really helps facilitate learning, not just in terms of the content, but the way that content is kind of, uh, of sh uh, shared so that individuals can kind of generate knowledge. And, and we are focusing um, not in the exact terms, but we're focusing on how to kind of integrate high impact practices which is related to undergraduate research. Um, not only with individual faculty, but how that, how those research conversations are fused uh, into the classroom, not just research, because a lot of times we think of research, we don't often add the ways that social scientists engage in historical archival research, uh, as well as bench top research. So that, so as we think about the spaces, the age of the spaces, um, and the fact that we are landlocked. Uh, we have to start thinking about the kinds of graduates we want to produce. So it's really, uh, again, it's focused toward the future uh, and looking at where we are now, but making sure we move toward a future that we want to create. So um, one of the questions was that was raised at the roundtable that I thought was really so powerful and for me resonated of what I flew back and as I planned this, this um, webinar was the connecting the dots between this campus and your stakeholder communities around the campus. And uh, does anybody have a brief comment on that about um, thinking about not only where your students come from and where they go, but the, the communities um, that you're School of Education works with and your employers and things like that. So anybody make a comment on that question? Well, I can make a, 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 a partial uh, comment and, and others can pipe, uh, <laughs> chime in, but Cal State LA is an incredibly regional institution. Um, probably 80% of our students come from a 15 to 20 mile radius of, of campus, but frankly, 
that is a population the size of many states. And so we, there's a phenomenal talent pool in, uh, in, in, in the youth in, in, uh, in, these, uh, uh, in these communities. So we have a responsibility as, as, as an institution to interact with our, with our communities. For example, healthcare is a huge issue. We need to train students if they're capable of going to medical school and coming back to those communities. Um, I, th thank you, Carlos. Um, what, we'll talk a little bit later about some of the things that are happening right now to kind of build some new kinds of connections within and beyond the campus. Um, so strategy number two that we spoke about, the first strategy was bringing the right people to the table to have a really wonderful, diverse group of people who were willing to speak their mind and be open. And that's one of the rubrics of good planning, is that um, you can share and not disagree. Um, and so we're going to talk about institutional assets. And I've asked Pam to kind of continue the conversation that Carlos um, spoke about who your students are and where they come from. And, and um, do you want to just make a few more comments after Carlos? Spoke? Sure, and I, and I will try to be brief. So th this particular uh, visual that you're looking at really gives you a framework of our students. Uh, we have about 28,000 students. 21,000 of those students are full-time students, and that includes graduate and undergraduates. 58% um, uh, of our students are uh, uh, Chicano Latino students. I, I think the, the Federal Registry considers us a HSI, Hispanic Serving Institution. About 30% of our students are, are Asian, uh, um, uh, Asian, Asian American. Only about 4% of our students are African American or, or from the African diaspora. And we have uh, other students, um, uh, Somali island, island students. Um, and so this really, um, allows us to really think about how the campus really can better serve our student population. About 75 to 80 percent of our students come within the LA, uh, Carlos mentioned the, you know, 15, 20 mile radius, but that's really the Los Angeles County. And so that's really important to us. So, um, some of you, um, live in different kinds of cultures. Um, the Appalachians or places like that, but kind of building on your culture and your surroundings and your stakeholder communities is really important. Emily? Yeah, just to add to that, I, um, I think about 70% of our students are Pell Grant eligible students, 80%. Um, and also, um, I know from my college, it's about 60% first generation to even attend college at all. I also, We've measured about 25% of our students' parents have never gone beyond elementary school. So, you know, we have these fabulous students with huge amounts of grit and persistence, but very often they've not seen people in professional roles. They haven't seen, they haven't been to, uh, you know, take your children to work day at, a, at an engineering firm or anywhere else that we train students to. So some of our, some of our space, Thinking has to be this. This may be the first time students have seen workspaces that they're that they're you know getting educated for. And I think the grit and persistence that you mentioned is one of the assets of the students that you have. Um, and I won't let Carlos say that, but he walked me through his science building yesterday and kept talking about these students with grit and persistence, the best students in the world. Um, the second asset, um, the next asset is. Um, um, now we're going to let Emily talk a little bit more about um, the assets. So, so we have two, the ending of assets here is going to be about the library and about the engineering program. So they'll speak briefly and then we'll move on to what they're thinking about doing now. All right, well we, uh, in, in our college we did it a uh, strategic plan that we finished uh, about two years ago. And um, this is before the university did its new strategic plan. Fortunately, ours is still good after the university finished <laughs> there. Uh, but one of the, 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 the most important part of our strategic plan really was the, the set of commitments that we wrote, 11 commitments that would guide everything we plan, everything we do, every new initiative, and, and, and every, every activity. 
And I'm just going to read a couple of those as they relate to space. One commitment was that we would nurture a deeply engaged faculty and staff committed to enabling student success through quality curriculum, practical experience, responsive teaching, and active learning. Uh, cultivate an inclusive, open, and collaborative culture that instills a sense of community, connection, and engagement. And then a, a third one was, there is, equip our classrooms, labs, and facilities with modern, state-of-the-art tools and technology. So these commitments, uh, we printed them. Every faculty member has a copy on, I hope, on their wall. <coughs> but uh, we just keep coming back to these commitments as we, as we move along. And I think those three in particular reflect the conversations we're starting to have in the college about space. Almost every week, a faculty member or a chair, you know, starts saying, well, gosh, we've had this space forever, and we've been using it in a certain way, and it's only used once a week, and what if we rearranged all this, we've got different equipment, and then we can use it every day and create space for something. Can we hear more about that from you a bit, Emily? Because that's a very exciting story. I've learned a little bit about what you're doing. Um, and then the second um, strategic planning asset we have, um, Carlos is going to talk and anticipate his larger conversation about the library and just um, uh, talk about what's happening in your world, Carlos. Right. So, I mean, so like Emily, the library has been engaged in a lot of discussions about the future of the library and what that means as far as not only the space and what you're seeing. You'll see the space really is seeing sort of a tool like technology is, and we really need to effectively use that tool. So, uh, in coming here, I think one of the one of my goals was to get uh, people in the library thinking differently about the library. I think uh, the idea of learner experience, uh, learner centered environment, was very important for me in getting us to think differently about our spaces. So. Um, there's a lot of discussion right now in our strategic planning about what that means as far as how our spaces need to change, the services that need to change uh, in those spaces, the, the furniture, the technology. Uh, in many ways, just a way of thinking about what the library's role is in teaching and learning. I think that is quite a fundamental shift in thinking uh, for the library faculty and staff is that we are, uh, are trying to position ourselves as being really <coughs> the center of learning. And the library, like I mentioned earlier, is a very traditional library. The space is very traditional. The furniture, <laughs> we only have two types of furniture really in the library. So uh, we're really looking at expanding uh, the environment, changing the environment so it's more dynamic. It's, like I said, more learner-centered. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about sort of what we're doing in a second. But really, that was sort of a fundamental shift in thinking is we wanted to move beyond sort of the tradition of space, but more looking to uh, something that's more focused on the learner and less on the collections, which is historically what the library has been doing. Both the um, story from Emily and from Carlos, again, talk about following the field in that, I've got mixed metaphors here, in that early stage of the yardstick. And one of the things we've talked about <coughs> in subsequent roundtables and forums is when such questions are appropriate to ask, appropriate to prompt, so you kind of, uh, from an initial conversation, started thinking about who needs to do what, needs to think about it. And so, uh, when Emily reports that someone comes in and says, oh, we should be doing this now, so that's it. It happened um, spontaneously rather than by mandate from the dean, which probably would have meant it wouldn't have happened. Um, so let's um, now move to the um, center of our discussion. Gil, can you move to the next slide? It's really looking at Carlos's uh, <laughs> library. Yeah. So, um, we spent a lot of time, so the, the round table goes like, if you think of that iterative um, cyclical circle there that I spoke about at the beginning, um, people walk in with their questions, their questions are on the wall. We sit in a circle and share the questions and say, mm -hmm. then someone would say, oh, I think I'd like to talk more about that with, um, with Rene or someone else. And so they formed into small groups and they had two hours to kind of think through the implications for the, the question, the galvanizing, the congealing question that brought them together, and come out and share with the entire um, cadre of Roundtable colleagues. Um, and then it ended up really, someone said, um, we were kind of thir two-thirds of the way through that, I think what's happening here is we're thinking about an ecosystem for learning. And then that kind of 
brought all of the conversations and brought a focus of the conversations at that point. And so um, one of the architects with us was Beth Sharkey from EHDD, and so I asked her to make her pretty, the, the uh, poster that was produced at the round table. Um, so the next one is just from another one of the round tables, which really illustrates um, the, when things should happen in um, the yardstick of planning. This is from Indiana University, and all the things that need to happen in spots around the campus to try out the active learning places, to kind of get people to think about, assess, kind of reinvent, repilot spaces. And um, so they had all these scattered spaces around campus, and the old swimming pool became open, and they turned that into a collaborative learning facility. And so that's a perfect example, and, and um, Julie Johnson, who is their director of spaces and innovation at IU, um, said they couldn't have had the wonderful space they had without all this kind of piloting beforehand, with it, different people doing the piloting and sharing what they were doing. And so now we're going to talk um, again about um, things that have been happening since um, since I was um, since I was here on the last next last fall. So you want to um, go to the next slide. So here. I just captured some spaces. And so, Pam, I'm going to let you talk about uh, the, 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 I'll just call it a corridor space. <laughs> sure. sure. So, you know, part of in the, the lower left, okay, in, in the lower left, that uh, is uh, part of, the, of our new science complex. Uh, and what we did after uh, leaving our meeting was really to assess what our spaces looked like. Were our students sitting on the floors? Where did students normally or naturally gather? And so we've been working with the facilities and our, you know, um, staff on campus to make sure that if we're trying to put seating in that space, that that's going to be appropriate, um, that we've gone through. And, and we also have a student group that's working with us. That the students have a, a vested interest, they're a stakeholder. In, in how they want to use those spaces. So to the lower left, that looks like the LeCret building, which is part of our newest science building. The two things we want to do is we have no none of our research posters. I mean, Carlos has been, uh, Carlos Gutierrez has been involved in uh, uh, federally funded programs for a long time, and we don't have any of that work up. Plus, we also need seating areas for students and so we had to just make sure that we could put that in. We actually have two other buildings, one in Martin Luther King Hall, where our social science faculty are, and then we actually have some faculty in Emily's building in engineering. So as we um, start to plan these spaces, we do have to work with our colleagues. Uh, our colleagues, um, uh, Cheryl Ney, who's the Dean of uh, Education, and Ron Vogel, who's the Dean of uh, Health and Human Services, they also reside in King Hall with our faculty, so we'll be working collectively. So if nothing else about the round table, it reminds us that we do need to be working collaboratively. Um, Carlos, both Carlos talked about space not being owned by individuals or individual departments. So we do need to remind ourselves that every space we look at and we talk about has to, there is a conversation about how to use that space. But I was in, uh, very uh, committed to having more organic spaces for students to gather, to meet with faculty, to meet amongst themselves, because if they live within a five or ten mile radius, they're here, uh, because this is not a particularly residential campus, they need spaces to interact. So that, that really respect, reflects one of our spaces. We do have a lot of other photos like that that I took yesterday, but I decided that one is illustrative, and I wouldn't have to show all of them. Right. right. So um, up above is our two spaces from uh, my portfolio of photos from the University of Illinois, Chicago. And the one right above, the one that um, Pam was speaking about, is one of their starting um, initiatives. They call them OASIS. Now, somebody said OASIS mm -hmm. is probably not the right word because it looks like everything else is dry around it. But that. So they, about 10 years ago, um, began with students nudging and assistance to identify spaces in corners of buildings that, that could be transformed with annual budget money, not capital money. So they started with 
kind of lower grants where students took pictures of spaces. And you can see on the upper left how they renovated the space in the upper right. And so it's a modest first step just to kind of um, get things going. Um, they did other very interesting things. And if you're interested in seeing their whole story, you can either talk to me or um, I will get you in touch with the person who did that. Um, Carlos, when we talked yesterday and met in your space, um, you started, I don't know what your space looked like when you started, not as, not as stark yeah. as Pam's, but well, talk about your story. What it was, was a, a, an empty laboratory in the biological sciences building from the 1950s, and the university thought all they would have to do, well, it's an office space for a, the research training programs that I, that I direct, and they thought they just had to paint it, and then we would be happy. But we gave them some plans. We've been thinking about it for months, uh, a, a group of maybe 10 people. And we gave them plans down to where we wanted the, 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 the data jacks put in. And it's space that was meant to say to students as they came in, to parents, science is creative, science is messy. Come in here, join us. And, and uh, while this is not a research lab, this is your entry into that, that, that creative world, and it's remained that way. That office space is open to students. They come by, they're hungry, there's a little food there, but you can see it. We are around uh, Valentine's Day, that's why we have that red, uh, that red uh, 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 tablecloth. But the way space interacts with the users, and even with the casual users can have a profound impact on 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 those users. One of the reports that's been so important to me in kind of thinking through the continued work that I do in learning spaces was Crossroads report from the National Academy of Sciences engaged to Excel and it talked about um, dealing with um, with uh, underrepresented groups in the mm -hmm. sciences but one of the the quotes that I remember, and I feel that it kind of captures everything that you people have been doing here at Cal State LA, is that a student should walk into a space into a community and say, this is a group I would like to be a part of. I can see myself doing this, being this. And I think the stark space in the corner down there is not um, attractive or engaging, or doesn't, it's not a pull Correct. space. And so, um, so you can think of the modest things you could do, but, but it, the reason I brought up, cross, two reasons I brought up Crossroads, one is it's a solid report on how to enhance the learning of all students, particularly underrepresented students. But it, and it's got lots of data in it. But just to um, give me an opportunity to say there are lots of reports out there that people should be reading and listening to. So in addition to roundtables, in, in addition to networking inside an institution, network outside of the institution. Um, next, next one here. So here then, um, we're going to let uh, Carlos talk a little bit about the library, and then David and Carlos talk a little bit about um, their adventures in um, making spaces feel like learning spaces. So, so like I mentioned earlier, the library hasn't really been that <laughs> sort of like a, a learning environment. So the library was very traditional. The environment was very traditional. So uh, we, uh, before we started making any changes about the space, it was very important for us to have a deep understanding of how our spaces were being used. So we did a lot of observation of our students to find out where they were, uh, at what times were they in certain spaces, what were they doing, uh, were they working individually, were, were they working in groups. Uh, students are very creative and they will take advantage of pretty much any space we provide them. And we did, did notice, uh, which is, I'm sure, common in many old buildings, and very few electrical infrastructure, and students are obviously, you know, attracted to the electrical outlet. So we were very interested to know sort of how students were using our spaces. And uh, one of the ideas or sort of a philosophy that I brought here from my former institution was we really wanted to have the library be very student-centric. Um, and uh, the institution that I came from, uh, Grand Valley State University, uh, I was privileged to be part of a major library construction project, and we designed the building around sort of these four principles, which are the principles that I'm trying to um, introduce here. Uh, the first one is we want learning to be visible. So, I mean, there's a lot of uh, research that shows that students who are seeing other students engaged in academic pursuits, really that brings up sort of the energy of the space. So we were trying to 
create environments, spaces where students <coughs> can see other students engaged in learning. So uh, in many ways that meant opening up a lot of our spaces because our spaces right now are very compartmentalized. There's a lot of walls, there's a lot of doors. Uh, students really can't see others. I mean, beyond it being a security concern, for me it was more important for students to be able to see others and be seen by others. Learning is a very social activity. Students uh, want to be seen by other students and do some learning. So that was a very, very uh, important one for us. Uh, the other one, and this is uh, probably primarily true in libraries, where libraries uh, historically have been very restrictive environments. You couldn't do much in a library. I mean, you enter the library, there were a lot of do nots. You couldn't do anything in the library. So we wanted to change that thinking where we really wanted to align the library environment, with the student environment. So we wanted students to feel comfortable in this space, uh, really uh, introduce sort of a permissive culture, which an implied permissive culture, where students really felt that they can, uh, that this was their space, it was designed for them, they weren't uh, visitors of the space, it was their space. Um, the other one which is, was important in our observations is that uh, behavior of the students changes throughout the day and throughout the week and throughout the semester. So we wanted to have an environment which, that was dynamic, students can manage their environment. So we're looking at spaces that, uh, and creating spaces where students really are in control of their environment. I mentioned we only have two types of furniture. There's different types of learning that students, uh, different postures that students are in. Sometimes they're sitting on the floor, sometimes they're lying on the ground. So we wanted to provide uh, spaces and furniture that allow students really to take advantage of sort of diverse preferences that students have when they're learning. So we're looking at introducing new types of furniture, uh, in the library that's movable. Uh, again, we don't have a, a lot of individual study rooms, but we want to uh, provide spaces where students can create their own sort of private spaces and public spaces. So we're introducing a lot of mobile whiteboards where students can then create sort of these private spaces and open spaces. And what we're seeing is a lot of students who are coming in groups uh, are taking advantage of this. The library I sort of see as the largest academic neutral space on campus. So it's very really important for us to have an understanding of what all the other disciplines on campus, what their needs are. So the library in many ways uh, is, is, a, is a space that could meet a lot of the academic needs of the various colleges. So we're starting to have discussions with the other colleges about the type of spaces that they need. Like you now Pamela mentioned uh, the challenges she has with her from the building, but we want to know sort of what her students need as far as space uh, services and same with engineering and, and the arts and letters. Um, I, I think when, when, lo when you look at academic space, you're thinking of the traditional academic disciplines, but it's very important for the library to reach out to arts and letters because we have a lot of art students, a lot of music students, and really they sometimes don't see themselves as, or they don't see the library as a place where they can uh, do their work. So we're looking at creating spaces that really reach out to the entire campus community. So, uh, you know, in partnering with, uh, with Arts and Letters, we're looking at doing pop-up concerts or other type of events where students can actually display the work. I mean, Pamela was talking about you have all these blank walls uh, on campus. I think those are opportunities for us to showcase the work of our students. Uh, but again, there's different types of, of things that we can showcase. So we want to showcase uh, musical performances, art. Uh, so uh, in Arts and Letters, David, uh, in, in and Dean uh, Rennie ha has been looking at doing pop-up concerts throughout the campus, and I see the library as, as one obvious place to have us. Maybe, David, you can talk a little bit more about some of the pop-up concerts or pop-up events that you're having on campus. Uh, first, I just I also just want to underscore for all of us to look at the entire campus as an environment where learning and creative activity takes place. I think for some that's kind of a paradigm shift and it's really great to just look at the entire uh, environment as, as one great uh, place for learning. Um, the other thing also is for uh, performance skills. Any type of activity, um, obviously I'll focus on music, but any activity that has any kind of performance um, attached to it. In the professional world, the learning takes place and then the performance truly is a uh, culminating activity. For our students, we're not there yet, so the performance itself is still part of the learning process. Mm -hmm. There are skills that we can only learn and hone in performance. Typically in music, we will rehearse for a number of weeks, there's one performance and then that's it. And so that really limits our ability to learn from that performance. Um, 
The other thing also is, as a musician, I'm always looking at acoustics. And one of the best places on campus, which I have learned, our library, the second floor is much larger than the first floor, so there's this overhang. That, the acoustically, that is like one of the best places on campus to perform. If I had my choice, all of our concerts would be under that <laughs> overhang there, um, and uh, it's great. Um, uh, there are others that are not so performing spaces. In this space? So we were looking at where can we, how can we increase the number of performance opportunities for our students, and in, because that's an important part of their learning process, and how can we increase the visibility of our students as well. And so one of the first ones that we did was in the library, so that was, uh, thank you to Carlos for that. That was uh, wonderful. And uh, our musical theater workshop presented a series of scenes. And um, even for me, being raised with traditional libraries, it it's, uh, was unusual to have this musical performance going on, which was great. Um, but also looking at our forensics team and our public speaking showcase and poetry and other types of things as well as the performing arts and showing our student films. Um, we want to do more in the, in the library. Um, and one fantastic thing is the College of Business. Uh, the dean's office has contacted me and said, we want some uh, arts and letters performances at our end of the campus. So I'm just, so it's, Tell me what time, and we'll start working on when the students are available. So we want to have as many as we can. We have a nice courtyard. And, and that's a great place also. <laughs> so do we. Uh, <laughs> La Crette, the lobby we of have really great, the lobby is very good. We're going to need a booking agent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great problem to have. Yes. The, uh, the, the, the pink sign mm -hmm. in the corner um, of this, uh, I used this uh, as a comment in the round table, and I found this photo. George Mason University, uh, nearby me in Washington, D.C., has these staked around campus. And they do just prepare three or four minute lectures and they stand there and give a lecture. But David, when you were talking about um, different spaces to do um, perform, the Skidmore Fine Arts building, their library, their uh, elevator is big enough so they can haul things up and down but it's also designed acoustically with microphones so the students can go in and sing in the elevator and be heard throughout the um, museum. So I think the creativity of kind of getting people to think outside of the box and ask them some interesting questions. Uh, David? Uh, uh, just one other thing, I don't know if you were aware of that, but um, just uh, yesterday at noontime on Mariachi Ensemble, they started at the uh, outdoor performance space across from Student Union, but then they toured through campus. Oh, perfect. So every space a learning space, you make it a learning space. I did take some photos of walking around your campus yesterday, and I think it is as likely as many campuses are, but to transform them just from informal learning into formal informal learning. Um, I think we can um, bring the discussion uh, to a close, and uh, Gil, you want to just move us forward a little bit? Can I add something? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, Pam. Sure. I just want to go back to highlight a, a, a key point. We have first generation students who are local and whom we want to interest in being part of the next generation of knowledge generators. And so the more open our campus is, the more the the more we say to our students and their families, because we have to think about their families. We welcome you to our campus. The the better it is in helping us educate the next generation, and I I just want to underscore that. And Carlos is coming to us as deans and saying, you know, how can we take the library out of the library? So just even having books on tables, and and the faculty usually share their magazines, but they can put them out so that people can take them. So the more we open up our campus and say we welcome you, and we want to be a place that you feel included in, I think is critical. And that's why this conversation with so many of our colleagues across the campus has been fun and important. And, and this is Carlos Gutierrez, the chemist. Um, but let me say that we want to do things better because our students are already achieving beyond anybody's wildest dreams. We send more Latinos and Latinas to PhD programs in the sciences than any other 
four-year institution that has baccalaureate and masters as their highest degrees. So, so the talent is there. We can do it better. I should. I would also want to jump in and and really talk about what Emily said that that learning really happens in the most important space, which is inside their head. And what Carlo said about the rigidity of some of some spaces. We can do some things with existing space, trivial things. What I've started doing every now and then is before my students get to my organic lecture, I will take all of their chairs and push them into one corner. They have to come in and they have to organize how they control their space. That changes the way they think about their space and what they're going to be doing. Um, it's a royal pain in the rear end because then afterwards I have to put them nice back in, in straight rows or facilities and going to get upset with me. But yeah, but, but that simple act of them moving their chairs around and deciding how it goes does something to the learning space. Scooters take ownership of their own learning and their learning space. So um, I just found this poster in my archives when I was thinking about this. This came from another uh, workshop, not a round table, but this is a, this is a, um, a visual of, from one group of uh, faculty who thought this illustrated the ideal wow. learning space. It's like a gym. The whole is an ecosystem. So um, we're going to um, move a little further ahead. So keep thinking about the I'm going to ask each of these five panelists to say one thing that they are doing now to kind of keep the conversation going and um, in a maybe a messy but somewhat organized way. So, David, let me start with you. In our uh, department chairs meetings, we talk about this uh, each time and just trying to get out of the traditional ways of thinking about and using space. And just as far as department offices and faculty offices and classrooms and so forth, and you know, are there, uh, you know, how can we think outside the box? And we may might throw out an idea for the day and then have some time for discussion on that. And you don't have an agenda for your meeting that you go through, and then you all meet. There's some open endedness. We what we're what we're trying to do in our de department uh, chair meetings is we have 30 minutes for getting through whatever the agenda is, and then we have an hour for just discussion on the future and our students and learning and how we can make that a better uh, environment. Um, I think what, what is, has been most valuable for me is, is discussions about what are we all about? What are we supposed to be doing? What experiences, what, what knowledge base do we want our students to be involved in creating. Um, if we get clarity of that type, other considerations such as space follow a little bit a little bit uh, a little bit better. But if we don't have those those long term conversations, I think it becomes very difficult to do everything else. So one of the things that we did more immediately is to kind of look at where space is not alive. So Carlos uh, Rodriguez talked about dead space. So I've been talking to a couple of department chairs about, you know, uh, bookcases or trophy cases that have no trophies, maybe a few dead animals, about how we might move them. So, you know, we're very respectful of every stakeholder uh, because we want the spaces to live and we want the, our students to know that they not only are they important to us, but their future is important to us and that we have to continue to think about the fact that the entire campus is a learning environment and that while there might be some content shared in classrooms, that the entire campus is about what is important to them as they grow and as they, um, as they learn. I, I will add one just quick thing. Uh, we, we invited to our um, learning spaces our, our team from our Center for Teaching and Learning where we've been engaged in pedagogical conversations because it's not just the space. We, have to, we as faculty have to do something differently in the space. And they've been a great partner on the campus as well as our, our, our dean of our library. Yeah, I think um, in our college we've been hiring a lot of faculty. We, we um, 
we grew very rapidly, and now we're hiring back, and we have a lot of young new faculty. And um, as they've come in and said, well, I, you know, where's my lab? I need a lab of this size, or, you know, I need this or that. And we're trying to steer the conversations towards, well, who else does this? You know, what collaborative spaces can you create for grad students working together or for two or three or four or five faculty to build a shared space? Uh, I mean, partly we just don't have as much space as people would like, but also learning, modern day learning happens in collaborative spaces with interdisciplinary teams. So I, I just turn the conversation back very often to, well, who else is involved? What else are you going to do? How will this get used? Um, in, the, in the fullest way possible. I also do the same thing with students. Um, we used to have a study space in our building. Um, and this is a, a considered a best practice for minority engineering programs to have a special learning space. But our college is all minority engineering students. And so we, we took that space from the students and turned, and turned it into something else we needed. And now we just keep saying to the students, you have a learning space. It's called the library. It's about 10 steps away. I can do this knowing that the library is now changing and has collaborative spaces and spaces you can eat and spaces you can bring your team to work. So uh, I think it's, it's just important to keep reflecting these conversations back. How can they be more collaborative? How can we use more areas on campus and get away from this kind of single-minded my space Check idea, the checkerboard, because it just that's just not going to work anymore. So um, I've really appreciated just having opportunities to talk to others outside the library about what their new space needs are. I think the library historically probably hasn't done enough to really have a deep understanding. I mentioned that we we were trying to get a deep understanding of our how our students are using our spaces, but we actually need to be out talking and looking at other spaces on campus. I think there's, I mean, libraries historically um, have had a lot of space for students. And a lot of the decisions that libraries have made about this space have been really in isolation. They haven't had a lot of discussions and, and, and just listening to the campus community about what type of spaces do they need. So the library historically, and again, this goes back to sort of the historical purpose of the library, which really was a repository of, of information. Uh, you know, the formats have changed, but uh, I think what hasn't changed is how our spaces are being used. And I think right now it's very important for the library to be engaged with these discussions. And again, like I mentioned, the library really has, uh, is in a unique position in that we're interdisciplinary. We really serve the entire campus, not just um, all the colleges, but also our staff on campus, sometimes people think about uh, or don't think about. So I think it's very important for the library to continue to have these discussions, not just with our faculty and our students, but also with our staff and increasingly with our community. Because I think, like Carlos was saying, I mean, we're most of our students <laughs> come from this area. Uh, their families are in this area. And I think there's an opportunity for the campus to reach out more to the community. And I, I can see the library as a community space. Right now, we're sitting in the community room of the library, and, and this type of space really was designed to provide opportunities for not just the campus community, but for the general local community to learn more about the university, uh, have these discussions. Uh, so I, I'm trying to have these discussions not only with the campus community, but with the surrounding community. I think that's important as well. I think that's a big part of the strategic direction of the university is to do more of that. So uh, we're going to um, kind of end with some um, resources that you can continue to, to look at and that really informed our conversation at the round table. We had five architects um, participating. Um, um, one of them is here, Michael Vandenberg, and I will ask him to say something in a minute, and I will alert Steve Wright in Maryland that we're coming to him in a minute. But the um, architects had to put together a portfolio <coughs> of a recent project and the questions that drove the project that they worked with the clients with. And um, their folks, all five of these portfolios are on the LSC website. Um, this is planning a remodeled room in a library for introductory biology. 
And so the one of the, the drive one of the five driving questions was that that a faculty in, in biology who were going to be working in the library, how would they talk to their colleagues about what this was going to be? The next one is um, is a remodeled um, um, classroom at George Washington University. So it is an historic building that they turned into a STEM building. And the story of doing that is really quite interesting. So again, I invite you, the link to this is on the LSD website. And just to both listen to the questions, look at the photos that are the resulting um, the physical product of their wrestling with those questions. And the next one, I think, is um, it's another a science building. And, and uh, Rick Hines from RFD um, um, always asks the questions about the common vision in the planning. And I think this firm and the firms that um, have been actively involved with the LSC are really interested in pressing the vision and the interconnectedness and, and beyond the sciences, I would say, that, that learning is a vision. So I don't know if Steve Wright now is on and could say a few words, Steve? Hello, Jeannie. How are you? Hi. Fine. So um, the, the project at uh, University of Minnesota at uh, Winona State University, can you go to that next slide? This is a this is a brand new college of education, and so our yardstick was uh, was very much how are we going to, to transform an existing building? Uh, Can you talk a little louder, Steve? Sure. Uh, to transform an existing building, to um, create a new college of education, how are we going to uh, connect pedagogy and the physical en environment to help open minds, and how can we encourage future teachers to do the same thing? And um, it, it deals not only with space, but in uh, technology and what aspects of, of current teaching, social media culture um, can be used to promote learning. And finally, how do we create spaces that enable group learning? How do we enable this to happen in formal, informal spaces? And where do we go and why? Um, in, in many ways, uh, and I'll go off script just a little bit, Jeannie, but in many ways, they're dealing with some of the same issues that are being dealt with at uh, um, at, at Cal State LA, and and uh, but perhaps not at the magnitude. I was I was so struck being there uh, to be with an institution that had grown um, nearly 10,000 students in in 10 years, uh, mostly with an underserved population. And so, uh, you know, I think if that were overlaid with this. Uh, half of our yardstick, eight, at least 18 inches, would be taken up with with defining defining the culture and how to, as Carlos I think said um, uh, many many times, how can we create space that doesn't make the student feel unworthy or not worthy of, of uh, uh, that that the space is not worthy of them, and um, uh, that's really important and a little bit. Uh, uh, you know, humbling as you start to a design process. Michael um, has been um, helping us um, set up an on-site um, webinar. Without him, we wouldn't have been able to hear anybody but me, or we've been passing the, the you know, microphone back and forth in some way that we would not have been able to figure out. Um, Michael, I asked him to say something because um, many of your questions, or several of your questions, and why is this meeting uh, around table of interest to us dealt with technology. So. Um, in three words, will you solve the future of technology and education setting? Sure. One of the things we go back into is looking at the yardstick. We get early on in the yardstick and we look at the technology infrastructure. We look at our goal. We look at where we want to go and we look many years out because technology is going to cycle through multiple generations for a building life cycle. So we want to really look and plan the infrastructure appropriately for changing uh, technologies that are they're going to kind of continue on and develop. There's some really exciting technologies out there that we can work with, but one of the things too is looking at that and how we uh, how we build that into the curriculum. So looking at the administrative side, looking at the curriculum, looking at professional development planning, so we can get the instructors knowledgeable and passionate 
about those technologies that are coming up and how do those work into how you instruct, how these, uh, how these students can interact with that and have it really be a powerful learning tool rather than just a, a crutch or something that's out there. So. Thank you, Michael, yeah. and thank you for your contribution no, thank to you. the webinar. Um, so there's, you have the, web, the link to the uh, LSE website with particular link to the materials from the last round papers in 2016. There's a depth of information there, essays from the campuses, questions people um, brought to the table and brought posters up and tore apart and put them back together. Um, and so we're continuing to do this. We're continuing to post. My goal is to have uh, half of a report done by mid-May when we're going to talk to the um, Division of Undergraduate Education about um, um, planning 21st century learning spaces for 21st century learners. And um, then we're going to keep posting. The first posting that's going to go up in the next two or three weeks is about the user. And I took the questions and the comments and the essays about who the user is. And I'm putting them together in a, a first stage draft to um, translate, um, to share what we've learned back to that cycle of inspiring, learning, creating, sharing, and then start all over again. So um, I would like to um, invite you to um, look at the resources and um, build the next one um, to join us for our our next series of activities, the, um, the next webinar will be kind of interesting. I've never done this before and always wanted to do it, to have a webinar on um, questions for and from 21st century clients and um, to um, do some anonymous ones and um, kind of talk about this conversation. It's another crossing the dots opportunity to kind of work together rather than just dropping the architects in in the three inches between is 29 and 32. Um, when I say conversations, and these will be not my webinar conversations, but I'm going to bring people in, stakeholders, shepherds who've had a re significant responsibility um, about how you manage a project, and they will, people can call in and we can talk, so that'll be a call in. And then the final webinar in June will be um, a big um, uh, expose, I think, of the roundtable report. So. I will clap here for the people in the audience um, to thank the panel here for joining us today. Today we can all thank them. And, um, we did have a question from one of them. Oh, I did. What was the question, Mike? Uh, a question uh, from Natasha Ramsey. Uh, she was asking, how do you build and improve learning spaces for online students? That is a great question. And, and I ask, can I ask Natasha? <laughs> that we will ask, um, not invite um, these these panelists to do it, but to, we will get back to her. Does, does she have her email address there? Uh, we'll, we'll You'll get it. Session. Right, right. That is a lovely thing. And if anybody else in the audience has answers to Natasha, please um, share with us. Unless the panelists here have something you want to say. Emily. Yeah, I, I think that there are some, uh, you know, online learning platforms that have a lot of, let's say different technologies, right? Um, you know, blog spaces, video spaces, all the different kinds of things. And I think in some ways, we should be using online learning platforms to think about what we do in the classroom. That, that, that online, I mean, a really, really good online teaching space is better than many of our in-person teaching spaces because instead of using multimodal activities in the classroom, we just do one. Whereas the online platforms often have many different ways of communicating between instructor and student and student and student and so on. So I, I would actually flip it around and say, how can the best online learning platforms uh, inform what we do in classroom design? I was also just taking a look to see if our, our team from our Center for Effective Teaching and Learning uh, was here, but I'll, I'll give uh, Catherine Kat Harris's name, who is mm -hmm. the director of that program. They've been working with our faculty in that regard, and she would be a good resource for her. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 
with that, um, we say goodbye and thank you for joining us. And um, send us your thoughts and further questions, and I will share them with this group of colleagues and um, some of the other people that I feel um, have been an important part of my learning spaces collaboratory. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.